Hello everyone, today we are excited to bring you the highlight from ESMO 2024 focusing on GI malignancies. I'm Rohit Gosain and I'm here with my brother and co-host Rahul Gosain. Out of thousands of abstracts presented at this Congress ESMO 2024, we have selected four key studies with significant implications for our practice and community today. To guide us through and make sense of this data, we are thrilled to have Dr. Kristen Siember, a GI medical oncologist from Vanderbilt University. Kristen, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Kristen, welcome. Over the next 20 minutes, we'll focus on four abstracts, starting off with the recent update of LEAP012 in HCC. Then we'll discuss Keynote 811, showing updated overall survival data in GE junction and gastric cancer. We'll switch gears to podium studies showing overall survival benefit in anal cancer. And then finally, we'll touch on niche to study a success story for our MSI high patients. Okay, so let's take a dive into this. Starting off with LEAP012. Kristen, can you walk us through the study design and its findings here? Sure. So LEAP012 is a study um, for patients with HCC. Now, as with most HCC studies, they did have to have child PUA disease, which is a little bit tough um, for some of our patients to qualify for, but it was for good reason. Um, patients had to have uh, lesions that were treatable with taste in either one or two sessions. They could not have had extra hepatic disease and no, no portal vein thrombosis. Um, so patients who were uh, enrolled were randomized in one-to-one -one fashion to lenvatinib, pembrolizumab plus taste versus placebo, double placebo plus taste with the primary endpoints that they were looking for were both PFS and overall survival. So what we saw here was an interesting improvement in uh, PFS with a hazard ratio of 0.66 in favor of the lenvatinib pembrolizumab plus TACE arm uh, versus dual placebo plus TACE. So this was the median PFS difference was about four and a half months, which was fairly significant with good separation of the curves. The overall survival um, data is still immature, so we have to wait a little bit longer um, to get more information from that, which is really why I think we, we need to um, be cautious before we make any firm conclusions on the data. Thank you, Kristen. Kristen, I have a few things to reiterate here. As you stated, this was rather a child PUA population, which would we would like to see in our clinic, but unfortunately that is not the case for this particular tumor type. And for from liver-directed therapy standpoint, we did a podcast and discussion with IRs and RADONs a few months ago, and we what, what, what was concluded was that SBRT over TACE is a better modality. So seeing if that translates into this, though this was only with uh, TACE here. Also, LEAP002, which was Pembro with lenvatinib and first-line HCC, was in fact a negative study. Well, as we see that PFS is better, but we'll have to, as you said, OS is what is going to determine if this is going to replace the standard of care option here. Let's switch our gears to Keynote 811, which indeed is in fact a standard of care option for HER2-positive GEJ and gastric adenocarcinoma patients. Kristen, can you please walk us through the study design and important takeaways here? Sure. So Keynote 811, we've been watching for a while now. This is a study that enrolled patients with advanced or uh, uh, unresectable gastric or GEJ adenocarcinoma who had been previously untreated. As you mentioned, they were HER2 positive, so they had to be IHC3 plus or IHC2 plus FISH positive. And so patients were randomized in this study in a one-to-one -one fashion to pembrolizumab plus trastuzumab plus chemotherapy, so either 5-Effusis platin or KBOX with the majority of patients um, receiving KBOX versus uh, trastuzumab plus chemotherapy plus placebo. And patients were treated until uh, toxicity um, or progression or a maximum of 35 cycles of treatment. So we had originally seen in the early interim analyses, we had seen really Im impressive response rates um, with the pembrolizumab arm. And this actually led to accelerated approval in, this, um, in the, this patient population. So over time, as we've seen more of the data roll out and some of the longer term information, uh, what we saw here was the overall survival analysis at, at, um, in the intent to treat population. And what we saw was that the median 
overall survival was in fact better in the pembrolizumab arm versus placebo. Now, what has been a little bit controversial in this study was really the uh, data behind the subgroups of, according to pd one and PD-1 status. So um, it did look like the patients benefited more the higher the PDL1 score was, which makes sense um, as we might imagine, but um, but it, it did show an improvement in all comers. Kristen, this OS certainly reinforces our current practice, but taking a little deeper dive into the subgroup analyses, in your clinical practice, a patient that is PDL1 negative, because as you've stated, PDL1 and above, we saw more benefit with pembrolizumab. So PDL1 negative patient, would you add pembrolizumab or consider just chemo and trastuzumab? Yeah, I, I, in the PDL1 negative patients, both HER2 positive and HER2 negative, I do not give a PD1 inhibition um, to those patients because you do have to think about the toxicity. We traditionally think immunotherapy is, um, is reasonably non-toxic, but it can have significant Absolutely. adverse events that can be irreversible. So I think it's important to maximize um, the safety and the benefit there. So I don't give patients who are PDL1 negative um, this particular treatment. Um, but, you know, in this study, actually 85% of patients were PDL1 positive. So it does go to show that most patients will be eligible for this treatment. Absolutely. When talking about these biomarkers, another biomarker, and we saw an update here at ESMO 2024, was also with Clotin 18.2. Zolbituximab showed overall survival. We're waiting FDA approval on that. And then we also saw TDXD is showing activity in HER2 positive space as a general community oncologist. That's not surprising because we've seen that in lung cancer, breast cancer, of course. So we'll wait on these studies and see how this space continues to change. Okay, yeah, now- it's better to have more options for our patients. <laughs> ab absolutely. Let's talk about podium trial. One of the biggest anal cancer trials in metastatic on unresectable settings for this, this disease site. Kristen, study design here and its findings, please. Yeah, so the just to kind of set the stage for Podium 303, there was the original INTERACT study, which looked at uh, first-line uh, patients with metastatic anal cancer, locally recurrent, and that randomized patients to either Carbotax or 5 um, fu cisplatin. And so what we saw there was that there was actually an improvement with the Carbotax arm in terms of uh, response rates and other, other endpoints. So that clearly became the first-line um, first regimen that was um, the best for metastatic anal patients. Um, so what INTERACT2 or this Podium 303 study looked at was patients who had not been pre previously treated, who were eligible for chemotherapy, they were randomized to either um, Carbotax uh, plus placebo versus Carbotax plus retifanlumab, which is a PD-1 inhibitor. So we know from prior data that in the second line and beyond from the NCI 9673 study that there were patients who definitely benefit from nivolumab in the second line and beyond. Um, but the question here was, okay, can can really adding this to chemotherapy in the first line uh, make a difference and help patients more? Um, so this study design did allow for a uh, crossover in patients um, who were um, who were randomized to the chemo alone arm, arm at first. So what we saw um, from Dr. Rao's presentation at ESMO was that um, that the PFS actually was statistically significantly different in favor of the retifanlumab arm, and this was just an interim analysis of overall survival. Um, but it did favor, it was trending towards an improvement in overall survival with the addition of retifanlumab too. And as you said, this is a very large study um, of about 300 patients, which was the kind of the biggest one we had seen so far. It's great to see the progress in this particular challenging disease. Close to six months of overall survival benefits. Sure, we have to say how it translates even in longer term there, but this is impressive at this point where it stands. This will, in fact, be the new standard of care treatment in this particular disease. Would you adopt this as a new standard of care, or would you rather wait for a longer-term data, Kristen? Yeah, it's a great question. And I do want to say that um, we just this week completed a cruel on our uh, ECOG Akron 2176 study, which is looking in the a similar patient population in the first line setting of Carbotax plus or minus nivolumab. Um, so we should have data on that soon. 
which hopefully will um, confirm what we've seen and kind of add to our information on um, on how to utilize this um, this type of regimen in our patients. But I do think this will become a new standard of care. Well, certainly exciting times. Well, finally, let's discuss niche two study. Since the inception, this one has been practice changing, which has shown remarkable results for MSI high patient population. Kristen, can you please walk us through this update and importantly, its implications in your practice? Yeah. So niche two is part of a larger a platform of studies um, that we've seen over time. We also saw the niche three study at ESMO this year um, as well. But um, Miriam Shabi presented the update to niche two, uh, which was essentially um, enrolling patients with MSI high um, colon cancer. And so instead of going straight to surgery, they did receive nivolumab and ipilimumab. Um, it, they they got one cycle of the combination, then they got an additional dose of nivolumab, and then went straight to surgery. So prior data that we had seen showed just impressive waterfall plots with um, about two-thirds of patients, even with this limited amount of neoadjuvant therapy, actually receiving, um, achieving a pathologic complete response. So as with any of these um, neoadjuvant studies, we really need to see d disease-free survival data. And that's what Miriam uh, presented at this meeting. And uh, a new form of a Chalabi plot, so to speak, <laughs> not just the, the waterfall plot, but actually oh. this complete completely flat line of 100% three-year disease-free survival. So really impressive. Um, when you compare that to historical data in terms of patients who got who had stage three MSI high disease, there are still recurrences and we, we still give those patients chemotherapy. Of course, we're awaiting um, the adjuvant data um, in atomic to try to see if chemo plus immunotherapy is better. But you know, this may be trumping that in the sense that maybe we just give a little bit of neoadjuvant immunotherapy. You know, an additional data point, a kind of a secondary endpoint that they looked at was ctDNA clearance. So um, interestingly, most of the patients did have ctDNA positivity. So we always wonder, okay, what's the sensitivity of this technology? Um, by cycle two of immunotherapy, about half of patients had uh, cleared their ctDNA. And then by the time of surgery, 83% had. And by the MRD endpoint, which was three weeks after surgery, all patients had cleared their ctDNA. So it just gives, a, gives us an additional um, bit of information or um, additional data point to follow uh, in addition to scans for patients. I think we all need to take a second to appreciate 100 percent three-year <laughs> disease-free survival. This is remarkable. This is exciting. But Kristen, coming back in this MSI high space, we have a few options here. Single agent Pembro, a short course of Epinevo, as we're seeing here in niche two. Outside clinical trials, what is your preference? And then we're touching on the ctDNA. If a patient has ctDNA negative disease, can we forgo surgery? Mm. That's a great question. Those are great questions, actually. So um, I still do prefer, uh, there are ongoing clinical trials in this space, and I always prefer that because we do need sure. more data, to be believe it or not. I, I think Dr. Shabi mm -hmm. has kind of raised the bar, certainly, with our data, um, but uh, but I think we there there are still unanswered questions, including, as you mentioned, um, do we need doublet immunotherapy? Do we need um, what duration do we need? Do we even need to do surgery at all? Can we can we treat patients with immunotherapy only? So there are a lot of unanswered questions here. Um, in terms of the ctDNA, um, you know, relying on that, I'm not quite ready to rely on ctDNA um, solely to make treatment decisions um, because it, it's not a perfect uh, technology yet, um, but it is improving and hopefully we'll get there. Um, but I do use it as an uh, additional data point um, understanding certainly the limitations of what it can mean. Well, Dr. Sionbor, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts around these key abstracts from ESMO 2024 in GI space. For our listeners, let us go over a quick recap. In this discussion, we had the opportunity to focus on four key abstract studies from ESMO 2024 with Dr. Kristen Sionbar from the Vanderbilt University. We've covered the LEAP012 study in HCC with TACE, lenvatinib, and pembrolizumab. We'll eagerly wait on mature OS benefit here before this is widely adapted in our clinical practice. Then we had a chance to discuss Kino 811, the current standard of care for our HER2 positive GE junction gastric adenocarcinoma. Now we're seeing 
an improved overall survival benefit with pembrolizumab chemotherapy and trastuzumab. This update continues to reinforce this as our current standard of care option. We also covered podium study for metastatic or unresectable anal cancer. Given overall survival improvement, chemotherapy with IO is now going to be our standard of care. To end, we touched on the success story of NISH2 trial, where we see 100% disease-free survival for our MSI high patients with immunotherapy at three years. Thank you for tuning in. Make sure to check out our conference highlights and discussions around the current standard of care. We are the Oncology Brothers.